The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Good afternoon. We continue our discussion of quantum states of light. We talked at length about coherent state. And when we talk about quantum states of light, each mode of the electromagnetic field is a harmonic oscillator. We also encountered naturally the number states. And we realized on yesterday, actually, in the last class, that those number states have non-classical properties. For instance, they have a G2 function, a second order correlation function, which is smaller than one, which is impossible for classical light, as you are proving in one of your homework assignment. So at that point, we have encountered coherent states, which are as close as possible to classical states. And we have found the number states as non-classical states. Well, are there other interesting states? I wouldn't ask you this question if the answer would not be yes. And this is what we want to discuss today. We want to talk about non-classical states of light, which we can engineer, actually in the laboratory, by sending laser light through nonlinear crystals. And uh, uh, those go by the name squeeze states. So, just to give you the cartoon picture, in our two-dimensional diagram with the quasi-probabilities, we have coherent states uh, where the area of this disk delta x delta p is h power over 2. It's uncertainty limited. But what we can do now is we cannot go beyond this. This is a fundamental limit of quantum physics. However, we can take this circle and we can squeeze it. We can squeeze it horizontally. We can, we can squeeze it into an elongated vertical shape. Or we can squeeze it at any angle. That's what we call squeeze states. And those states uh, have non-classical properties. They are important for metrology. They are important for teleportation. So there are lots and lots of reasons why you want to know about them. But again, as so often I feel, I cannot convey to you the excitement of doing squeezing in the quantum domain. And many, many physicists now, they hear about squeezing just in the quantum domain. But I want to start with classical squeezing. Classical squeezing, I will actually show you a video of, it, of an experiment on classical squeezing. You can see squeezing with your own eyes. But this is just sort of to set the stage to also get a feel what squeezing is. And then we do quantum mechanical squeezing. But maybe tongue in cheek, I would say, since Classical harmonic oscillators and quantum harmonic oscillators have a lot in common. The step from classical squeezing to quantum mechanical squeezing is actually rather small. Well, it's nice to squeeze light. It's nice to have those non-classical states. But the question is, how can you detect it? If you can't detect it, you can't take advantage of it. And the detection has to be phase coherent. I will tell you what that is. And it goes by the name homodyne detection. And finally, we can take everything we have learned together and, uh, uh, and discuss how in the laboratory teleportation of a quantum state is done. There is a nice teleportation scheme. And I want to use that as an example that the language and the concepts I've introduced are useful. So concepts like squeezing operator, displacement operator, uh, those methods allow us then to, in, in a very clear way, uh, discuss schemes which lead to teleportation.
So that's the menu for today. So let's start with classical squeezing. Uh, maybe I should tell you what, uh, for squeezing, we need a harmonic oscillator. It means we have a parabolic potential. We have potential V of x. And then we study the motion of Uh, that should be x squared, the motion of a particle in that. But maybe before I even get started in any equation, let me explain what the effect of squeezing will be about. If you have an harmonic oscillator, you have actually the motion of a pendulum has two quadrature components, the cosine motion and the sine motion, and they are 90 degrees out of phase. And what happens now is if you parametrically drive the harmonic oscillator, you modulate the harmonic oscillator potential at 2 omega. I will show you mathematically, it's very, very easy to show, that uh, depending on the phase of the drive, you will actually exponentially amplify the sine motion and exponentially damp the cosine motion, or if you change, vice versa. So by driving the system, you can amplify one quadrature component and exponentially die, die out the other quadrature component. And that is called classical squeezing. So let's do the math. It's very simple. Uh, our equation of motion has the two solutions I've just mentioned. It has a solution with cosine omega naught and one with sine omega naught t. And we have two coefficients. The cosine is called c. The sine coefficient is called s. It will be So, uh, no, I have to call it C naught because I want to call that C and S. And uh, so what we have here is we have the two quadrature components of the motion in a harmonic oscillator. And graphically, we need that for the electromagnetic field as well. When we have our two axes, like you know, the complex plane for the quasi probabilities, I call one the S plane, as the S axis, one is the Z axis. Uh, if, so there's just something which confuses me. Yes, if you have only uh, just give me one second, cosine. Yeah. Uh, if you have only cosine motion, this you, you, S, the S component is zero and the harmonic oscillator would just oscillate here. If you have only a sine component, you stay on the x-axis. And now, if you have an equal amount of cosine and sine, then you can describe the trajectory to go in a circle. Okay, this is just the undriven harmonic oscillator, which is I don't want to dwell on it any longer, but what we are doing now is we are adding a small parametric drive. Parametric drive means we 
modulate the spring constant or we replace the original <coughs> harmonic potential, which was this, by, by an extra modulation term. So we have a small parameter epsilon. And as I pointed out, the modulation is at twice the resonance frequency. So now we want to solve the equation of motion for the harmonic oscillator using this added potential. Uh, and uh, the way how we want to solve it is, uh, well, we assume epsilon is very small. So if the pendulum is swinging with cosine omega t, it will take a while for the epsilon term, for the small term, to change the motion. So therefore, we assume that we can actually go back and use our uh, original solution and assume that over short term, the epsilon term is not doing anything. So for short time, it looks like a harmonic oscillator with a sine omega naught and cosine omega naught t oscillation. But over any longer period of time, the small term will have an effect. And therefore, the coefficients c of t, c and s are no longer constant, but change as a function of time. Just give me one. OK, so we want to solve now the equation of motion. That means we use now uh, this here as our ansatz. And we calculate uh, the second derivative. We assume that the coefficient c and s are changing slowly. So therefore, the second derivative of c and s uh, can be neglected. By taking the derivative of the second derivative of the cosine term and the sine term, of course, we simply get minus omega naught square x of t. And now we have the second order derivatives. Since we neglect the second order derivative of c and s, the other terms we get when we take the second derivative is first derivative of c times first derivative of cosine, first derivatives of s times first derivative of sine. So we get two more terms which are minus omega naught c tot times sine omega naught t plus omega naught s dot times cosine omega naught t. So this is the second derivative of our ansatz for x. And uh, This has to be equal to uh, the force provided by the potential. So taking the, the potential uh, just give me one second one. Yeah, uh, we need now the derivative of the potential. For the potential, we use, of course, this line. The first part is the unperturbed harmonic oscillator, which gives us simply omega naught square times x. And the second term, due to the parametric drive, is 2 sine omega naught t. And now for x, we use our ansatz for x, 
which is the slowly changing amplitude c time cosine omega naught t plus s times sine omega naught t. Those two terms cancel out. Uh, so now we have products of trig function, sine 2 omega times cosine omega. Well, you know, if you take the product of two trig functions, it becomes a trig function of the sum or the difference of the argument. So if you take sine 2 omega naught times cosine omega naught, and we use trigonometric identities, we get an oscillation at 3 omega naught, and which is 2 plus 1, and 1 at a difference, which is omega naught. So let me write down the terms which are of interest to us, namely the ones at omega naught. So let me factor out epsilon omega naught squared over 2. Then we have the term C times sine omega naught t plus S times cosine. And then we have terms at 3 omega naught, which we are going to neglect. So now we look at, we compare the two sides of the equations. We have sine omega naught term, we have cosine omega naught term, and, we, and the two sides of the equations are only consistent if the two coefficients of the sine term and the sine term are the same. So therefore, we obtain now two equations. one for c dot, one for s dot. <coughs> and these are first order differential equations. The solution is clearly an exponential, but one has a plus sign, one has a minus sign. So the C component, the C quadrature component, is exponentially amplified with this time constant, whereas the sine component is exponentially deamplified. So therefore, and this, fin fi and this is, finishes the mathematical discussion of classical squeezing, we find that uh, S of t and C of t are exponential functions. In one case, it's uh, exponentially increasing. In the other case, it is exponentially decreasing. And that means that, well, if we go to our diagram here, and let's assume we had an arbitrary superposition of cosine and sine amplitude. So we, have an, we had a, this is cosine, this is sine. We had sort of a cosine oscillation and, and a sine oscillation, uh, which means that uh, the as a phasor, the system was moving on an ellipse. If the sine component is exponentially deamplified and the cosine component is, is exponentially amplified, that means whatever we start with is squashed horizontally, is squashed vertically, and is amplified horizontally, that in the end it will become a narrow strip. So this is classical squeezing. You may want to ask, uh, why did I neglect the 3 omega naught term? Well, uh, I, I have to, otherwise I don't have a solution, <laughs> because I have to be consistent with my approximations. So what I did here is I had an equation 
where I, neglect, I, I have the clear vision that the solution has slowly variable, a slowly varying C and S coefficient. And then I simply use that. I take the second order derivative, and I have only Fourier components with omega naught, the sine and cosine. Now, the, uh, I've made an approximation here. Uh, for the derivative of the potential, uh, the first line is exact. But in order to match the approximation I've done on the other side, I can only focus on the two Fourier components uh, resonant with omega naught, which I have here. So in other words, the three omega naught term would lead to additional accelerations, which I have not included in the treatment. So it's consistent with the answer. It's consistent with the assumption that we have we have resonant oscillations with a slowly changing amplitude. But there will be a small admixture at three omega naught, but it will be small. Any questions about that? Let me then show you a, an animation of that. Uh, classroom files. We have Dave Pritchard, professor of physics at MIT, demonstrating what squeezing is. Right now, we, we see a wave that's going around in a circle. What's next? What's going to happen now, Professor Pritchard? Well, if we drive it at twice the, uh, the basic period, then we will parametrically amplify one quadrature component, and we will unamplify the other one. So now I'm going to start doing that. And then you notice that its motion turns into an ellipse. We amplified this quadrature component, but we unamplified that one. Feel free to try it at home. <laughs> Actually, you may start to think about this demonstration. What he has shown was when you have a circular pendulum which goes in a circle or an ellipse and you start pulling on the rope with a certain phase, that one quadrature component will be deamplified, the other one will be amplified, and as a result, no matter what the circular or the elliptical motion was, after driving it for a while, it will only swing in one direction, and this is the direction you have amplified. There's one thing which should give you pause. I have discussed, actually, a single harmonic oscillator. What Dave Pritchard demonstrated was actually two harmonic oscillators. The harmonic oscillator has an X motion as a y and a Y motion. However, you can say this was just sort of a trick for the demonstration, because when you have a circular motion initially, you have the sine omega naught and the cosine omega naught component present simultaneously, and you can see what happens to the sine and the cosine component in one experiment. So in that sense, he did two experiments at once. He showed what happens when you have initially a sine component and what happens when you initially have a cosine component. Okay, so we know what classical squeezing is. And uh, what we have learned also, and this helps me now a lot to motivate how we squeeze in quantum mechanics, you've realized that what is really essential here is to drive at two omega naught. So we need, what we need now to do squeezing in the quantum domain, if we want to squeeze light, we need something at two omega naught. So let's now, squeeze quantum mechanically, go back here. So the second subsection is now squeezed quantum states. So what we want to discuss is we want to discuss a quantum harmonic oscillator 
we want to have some form of parametric drive at 2 omega naught. And this will result in squeezed states. Now, what does it require uh, if we want to bring in 2 omega naught? Well, let's not forget our harmonic oscillators are modes of the electromagnetic field. If we now want to couple a mode of the electromagnetic field at 2 omega naught with our harmonic oscillator at omega naught, we need a coupling between two electromagnetic fields. So therefore, we need nonlinear interactions between photons. So this was a tautology. We need nonlinear physics, which leads to interactions between photons. The linear physics means each harmonic oscillator is independent. So we need some nonlinear process, which will be equivalent to have interactions between photons. And the device which will provide that is an optical parametric oscillator. I could spend a long time explaining to you how those nonlinear crystals work, what is the polarization, what is the polarizability, how do you drive it, what is the nonlinearity. But uh, for the discussion in this class, which focuses on fundamental concepts, I can actually bypass it by just saying, assume you have a system, and this is actually what the optical parametric oscillator does is, you pump it with photons at 2 omega naught. And then uh, the crystal generates two photons at omega naught, which, of course, is consistent with energy conservation. And if you fulfill some phase matching condition, it's also uh, consistent with uh, momentum conservation. But I don't want to go into phase matching at this point. Uh, Technically, this is done as simple as that. You have to pick the right crystal. Actually, a crystal which does mixing between three photon fields cannot have inversion symmetry. Otherwise, this nonlinear term is zero. But uh, what you need is a special crystal. KDP is a common choice. And this crystal will now do for us the following. You shine in laser light, let's say, at 532 nanometer, green light. And then this photon uh, breaks up into two photons of omega naught. And this is how it's done in the laboratory. And the piece of art is you have to pick the right crystal. It has to be cut at the right angle. You may have to heat it and by make sure that you select the temperature for which some form of resonant condition is fulfilled to do that. But in essence, that's what you do. One laser beam, put in a crystal, and then the photon is broken into two equal parts. And these are our two photons at omega naught. Uh, OK, so we can bypass, I hope you enjoy the elegance, we can completely bypass all the material physics by putting operators on it. We call this mode B, and we call this mode A. So the whole parametric process, the down conversion process of one photon into two, is now described by the following Hamiltonian. We destroy a photon in mode B at 2 omega naught. And now we create two photons at om We destroy a photon at 2 omega naught, create two photons at omega naught. And since the Hamiltonian has 
to be Hermitian, the opposite, the time reverse process, has to be possible too. And that means we destroy two photons at omega naught and create one photon at two omega naught. So now we forget about nonlinear crystals, about non inversion symmetry in materials. We just take this Hamiltonian and play with it. So this is how we now discuss. Uh, uh, we are, one can discuss by simply looking at the Hamiltonian, what is the time evolution of a photon field under this Hamiltonian. We figure out what happens when you send light through a crystal and what is the output. And I want to show you now that the output of that is squeezed light, which is exactly what I promised you with these quasi-probabilities. We have a coherent state, which is a nice circle. We, we, time evolution, we time evolve the coherent state, our nice round circle, with this Hamiltonian, and what we get is an ellipse. And if you want intuition, look at the classical example we did before, which really tells you in a more intuitive way uh, what is happening. Okay, but we want to make one simplifying assumption here, and this is that we pump the crystal at 2 omega naught with a strong laser beam. So we assume that the mode B is a powerful laser beam, or in other words, a strong coherent state. Uh, so we assume that the mode B is in a coherent state described by coherent states are always labeled with a complex parameter, which I call beta now. Well, it's mode B, therefore I call it beta. For mode A, I've called it alpha. And uh, the coherent state has an amplitude, which I call R over 2, and it has a phase. Uh, we know, of course, that the operator B, the, the operator B acting on beta gives us beta times beta because the coherent state is an eigenstate of the annihilation operator. And this is now, but when we look at the action of the operator B plus, the photon creation operator, uh, well, you know, the coherent state is not an eigenstate of the creation operator. It's only an eigenstate of the annihilation operator. But what sort of happens is the coherent state is the sum over many, many number states with n. And the creation operator goes from n to n plus 1 and has matrix elements which are square root n plus 1. So in other words, if n is large, and if we don't care about the subtle difference between n and n plus 1, in this limit, the coherent state is also an eigenstate of the creation operator with an eigenvalue, which is a beta star. So this means that this means that we have a coherent state which, which is strong. Strong means it has a large amplitude of the electric field. Then the, the photon states which are involved, n, are large, and we don't care whether we have n or n plus 1. This is actually also, I should mention it here explicitly, this is sort of the step when we have a quantum description of light and we replace the operators B and B dagger by a C number, then we really go back to classical physics. Then we pretend that we have a classical electric field which is described by uh, the imaginary part of, of beta. So when you have a Hamiltonian uh, where, you, where you write down an electric field and the electric field is not changing, you have an external electric field, this is really the limit of a quantum field where you've eliminated the operator by a C number and this is essentially your electric field. And we do this approximation here. Because we are interested in the quantum features of mode A. A is our quantum mode with single photons or with a vacuum state, and we want to squeeze it. B is just the parametric drive. So with this approximation, we have only the A operators,
So this is our operator. So sorry, any question? Um, beta would give us a beta star, right? Uh, yes, thank you. That means here should be a minus sign. Yes. So, uh, okay. I've motivated our discussion with this nonlinear crystal, which generates pair of photons. This is the Hamiltonian which describes it. Uh, and if you want to have a time evolution by this Hamiltonian, you put this Hamiltonian into a time evolution operator. In other words, uh, you e to the minus iht is the time evolution. So, now, so if we now evolve a quantum state of light for a fixed time t, we apply the operator e to the minus iht to the quantum state of light. So what I've just said is now the motivation for a definition of this, the definition of the squeezing operator. The squeezing operator S of R is defined to be the exponent of minus R over 2 A square minus A dagger squared. Uh, so this is related to the discussion above. You would say, hey, you want to do time evolution, where is the i? Well, I've just made a choice of phi. If phi is chosen to be pi over 2, uh, then I get then the time evolution with the Hamiltonian above gives me the squeezing operator below. So with that motivation, we are now studying what is the squeezing operator doing to quantum states of light. Any questions about that? I know I spent a lot of time on it. I could have taught this class by just saying, here is an operator, the squeezing operator, trust me, it does wonderful things, and then we can work out everything. But I find this unsatisfying, so I wanted to show you what is really behind this operator, and, and I wanted to sort of you to have a feeling why, where does this operator come from and what is it doing. But in essence, what I've introduced into our description is now an operator which is creating and destroying pairs of photons. And this will do actually wonderful things to our quantum states. Uh, so what are the properties of this squeezing operator? Well, What is important is it is unitary. It does a unitary time evolution. You may not see that immediately, so let me explain that. Uh, you know from your basic quantum mechanics course that e to the i, e to the, op, e to the i operator A is unitary when A is Hermitian. So the squeezing operator, with the definition above, can be written as I factor out two i's, r over 2, a square minus a dagger squared. And you can immediately verify that this part here is Hermitian. 
if you do the Hermitian conjugate, a squared turns into a dagger squared, a dagger squared turns into a squared. So we have a problem with a minus sign. But if you do uh, the complex conjugate of i, this takes care of the minus sign. So this part is Hermitian. We multiply it with i. Therefore, this whole operator does a unitary transformation in Hilbert's bait. Any questions? OK. Uh, so after being familiar with this operator, uh, we want to know what is this operator doing. Uh, I can describe now what this operator does in a Schrödinger picture or in a Heisenberg picture. I pick whatever is more convenient. And for now, this is the Heisenberg picture. So in the Heisenberg picture, uh, what is changing are the operators. So therefore, in the Heisenberg picture, this uh, unitary transformation transforms the operators. And uh, we can study what happens when we transform the operator x. The, unit, uh, the unitary transformation is done by uh, trans the operator x is transformed by multiplying from the left side with s, left side with s, from the right hand side with f s uh, dagger. Uh, and you are familiar with expressions like this and how to disentangle them. You can, if you have an, if you have an e to the i alpha, e to the minus i alpha, if you could move the alpha past x if a, sorry, if a and x commute, i, i a minus i a would just give unity. So therefore, this expression is just x unless you have non-vanishing commutators between a and x. And I think you have solved in your basic quantum mechanics course many such problems which involve identities of that form. Then there are higher order commutator, the commutator of a with the commutator of Ax. And uh, unless one of those commutator vanishes, you can get an infinite series. Uh, now, our operator A Our operator A is nothing else than the annihilation operator A square minus the creation operator A dagger square. So we can express everything in terms of A and A dagger. Uh, and the position operator in our harmonic oscillator can also be expressed by a and a dagger. So by doing elementary manipulations on the right hand side and regrouping terms, you find immediately that the transformation, the unitary transformation of the Heisenberg operator x gives you an x operator back but multiplied with an exponential e to the r. And if we would do the same to the momentum operator, which is a minus a dagger over square root 2, we will find that the unitary transformation of the momentum operator is de-amplifying the momentum operator by an exponential factor. Mm -hmm. 
So if we would assume that we have a vacuum state in the harmonic oscillator, and the vacuum state, well, classically, it would be at x equals 0, p equals 0. Quantum mechanically, you have zero point noise in x and zero point noise in p. Then you would find that the squeezing operator is amplifying the quantum noise in x, but it squeezes or reduces the noise in p. So if we apply this squeezing operator to the vacuum state, we obtain what, some, what, is, oft, what is usually called squeezed vacuum. And it means that in this quasi-probability diagram, the action of the squeezing operator is turning the vacuum state into an ellipse. Uh, what, happens to, what happens to energy here? The vacuum state is the lowest energy state. If we now act with a squeezing operator to it, we obtain a state which has the same energy. Is it energy conserving or very high energy? Yes. Why? It's no longer the vacuum state. Huh? It's no longer the vacuum state, but it's a position of higher. Sure, energy. yeah. Don't let you fool. It's a vacuum state. We act on the vacuum state, but we get a state which is no longer the vacuum state. Now, can you maybe uh, uh, yeah, the reason why we have extra energy, the squeezed vacuum is very, very energetic because the squeezing operator had a dagger squared, a dagger, a dagger squared, a square. Well, a square, the annihilation operator acting on the vacuum, gives zero. So, but, but what we are creating now, we are acting on the vacuum, and we are creating pairs of photons. So we are adding really energy to the system, and the energy, of course, comes from the drive laser, from the laser 2 omega naught, which delivers the energy in forms of photons, which are split into half, and they go into our quantum field. Now, in the limit of infinite squeezing, I will show it to you mathematically, but it's nice to discuss it already here. In the limit of infinite squeezing, uh, what is the state we are getting? eigenstate of momentum. So the I, or we get the p equals zero eigenstate. So what is the energy of the p equals zero eigenstate? Mm -hmm. It has contained all number states. It contains all number states. Okay, you think, you think quantum mechanically, you, you think immediately into number states, which is great. But in a more pedestrian way, the P equals zero state has no kinetic energy. But if a state is localized in momentum P equals zero, it has to be infinitely smeared out on the x-axis. And don't forget, we have a harmonic oscillator potential. If you have a particle which is completely delocalized in x, it, it has infinite potential energy at the wings. 
So therefore, in the limit of extreme squeezing, we involve an extreme number of number states. Actually, I want to be more specific of photon pairs. We have, we have states with 2n, and n can be arbitrarily large. But you also see in the classical picture, that what the same classical picture, what we get here when we squeeze it is we get the p equals zero eigenstate, which has infinite energy due to the trapping, due to the harmonic oscillator potential. If we would allow the system now, after we have squeezed it, to evolve for a quarter period in the harmonic oscillator, then the ellipse would turn into a vertical ellipse. So this is now an eigenstate of x. It's the x equals 0 eigenstate. But the x equals 0 eigenstate has also infinite energy because, it, because due to Heisenberg's uncertainty relation, it involves momentum states of infinite momentum. Questions? Uh, displacement. Yes. Uh, A is the photon field, right? So P is roughly the elect uh, electrical field, right? Yes. So it's kind of that the electric field uh, times zero, and X is kind of the A, the, and it becomes it uh, the large. So electrical field is uh, squeezed. Yes. <coughs> uh, means we have no electrical field. We come to that in a moment. I will actually. I wanted to do a little bit more math. I mean, I to show you what is. I wanted to derive for you an expression of the squeeze state in terms in a number basis and such. But your question is absolutely correct. Uh, your your question mentioned something which is absolutely correct. By squeezing that, we have now. The p axis is the electric field axis. So now we have actually, in the limit of infinite squeezing, we have an electric field which has no uncertainty anymore. By, by squeezing the coherent state into a momentum eigenstate, we have created a sharp value for the electric field. We have created an electric field eigenstate. Well, you would say it's pretty boring because the only electric field state we have created is electric field E equals zero. But in the next half hour, we want to discuss the displacement operator. And I will tell you what it is, that we can now move the ellipses and move the circles anywhere where we want. So once we have an electric field state uh, which has a sharp value of the electric field at E equals zero, we can just translate it. But before you get too excited about having an eigenstate of the electric field, I want you to think about it, what happened after one quarter period of the harmonic oscillator frequency. It turns upside down, and your electric field is, has an infinite variance. So that's what quantum mechanics tells us. Uh, we, can, we, we can create electric fields which are very precise, but only for a short moment. So in other words, this electric field state which we have created would have a sharp value. A moment later, it would be very smeared out, then it has a sharp value again, and then it's smeared out again. I mean, that's what squeeze states are. Other questions? That's why we need homodyne detection. Yes, exactly. If if we have squeezed something which is sort of narrow, that's great for measurement. Now we can do a measurement of maybe a LIGO measurement for gravitational waves with higher precision because we have a more precise value in our quantum state. But we have to look at it at the right time. We have to look at it whenever the we have to look at it uh, synchronized with the harmonic motion. And homodyne detection means uh, 
we look only at the sine component or at the cosine component, or if I want to simplify it, what you want to do is, if you have a state like this, you want to measure the electric field, so to speak, stroposcopically. You want to look at your system always when the ellipse is like this. And the stroposcopic measurement is, as I will show you, in essence, a log-in measurement, which is phase sensitive. And this will be homodyne detection. So we can only take advantage of the squeezing of having less uncertainty in one quadrature component if we do phase-sensitive detection, which is homodyne detection. But now I'm already an hour ahead of the course. Okay, back to basics. Uh, we want to know We want to explicitly calculate now how does squeezed vacuum look like. So, so we are now actually want to do it twice because it's useful. We have to see it in two different basis set. One is I want to write down the squeezed vacuum for you in a number representation and then in a coherent state representation. So this squeezing operator is an exponential function involving a square and a dagger square. And of course, we are now using the Taylor expansion of that. We are acting on the vacuum state. And I will not do the calculation. It's again elementary. You have n factorial. You have terms with uh, if a dagger acts on zero, you create two photons. It, 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 if it acts again, it adds two more photons. And the matrix element of a dagger acting on n is square root n plus 1. You just sort of rearrange the terms. And what you find is what I will write you down in the next line. But the important thing you should immediately realize is that the squeeze state has something very special. It is a superposition of number states, but all number states are even because our squeezing operator creates pairs of photons. This is what the parametric down conversion does. We inject photons into the vacuum, but always exactly in pairs. And therefore, it's not sort of a random state. It's a highly correlated state with very special properties. OK, if you do the calculation and regroup the terms, you get factorials. You get 2 to the n. You get another factorial. You get hyperbolic tangent, sorry, to the power n. And the normalization is done by the square root of the Cauch function. And the more we squeeze, the larger are the amplitudes at higher and higher n. But this is also obvious from the graphic representation I've shown you. Uh, let me add the coherent state representation. So we, we can, the coherent states are related to the number states in that way. Uh, so if we transform now from number states to coherent states, the calculation gives straightforward calculation gives now superposition over coherent states. 
coherent states require an integral e to the minus e to the r over 2 divided by Anyway, all these expressions, they may not be in its general form too illuminating, but those things can be done analytically. Uh, I just want to mention the interesting limiting case of infinite squeezing. Uh, when you do the integral over alpha, is this over like the magnitude of alpha, or the real point, or the complex Uh, I th I I remember, but I'm not hundred percent sure that alpha is real here. I mean, it sort of makes sense because we start with a vacuum state, and if we squeeze it, we are not really going into the imaginary direction. So I think what is involved here only real alpha, but. For negative r, we should get the other squeezing For negative r, we need imaginary state. So we should really be the entire thing. Let me double check. I, I don't remember that. You know, that's sometimes, I admit it, the issue. If you research material, prepare a course some years ago, you forget certain things. If I had prepared the lecture and everything worked out yesterday, I would know that. But certain things you don't remember. And as far as I know, it's a real axis, but I have to double check. Uh, the, the limiting case, of course, is quite inter is interesting. If r goes to infinity, you can show that this is simply the integral d alpha over coherent states. So we have discussed uh, graphically the situation where we had So these are quasi-probabilities. So in that case of infinite squeezing, we have the momentum eigenstate p equals 0. This is the limit of the infinitely squeezed vacuum. And in a coherent state representation, it is the integral over coherent state alpha. I'm pretty sure that alpha is real here. So seeing that now. Uh, there is a second limit, which happens simply can say by rotation or by time evolution, which is the x equals 0 eigenstate. And this is proportional to the integral over alpha when we take the coherent state i alpha and we integrate from minus to plus infinity. OK, so we have connected our squeezed states, the squeezed vacuum, with uh, number states, with coherent states. Now we need uh, one more thing. So far, we have only squeezed the vacuum. And we have defined the squeezing operator uh, that it takes a vacuum state and elongates it. Uh, in order to get generate more general states, we want to get away from the origin. And this is done by the displacement operator.
the, the definition of the displacement operator is given here. The displacement by a complex number alpha is done by putting alpha and alpha star into an exponential function. And in, in, in many quantum mechanic courses, you show the very easily the elementary properties that if uh, the displacement operator is used to transform the an annihilation operator. It just does that. And if you take the, if you take the complex conjugate of it, so in other words, what that means is it's called the displacement operator. I just take it as a definition, but you immediately see why it's called the displacement operator. When we do the unitary transformation of the annihilation operator, we get the annihilation operator displaced by a complex number. So the action, the transformation of the annihilation operator is the annihilation operator itself minus a C number. So therefore, we say the annihilation operator has been displaced. So this is the action of the displacement operator on an operator, on the annihilation operator. Uh, the question is now, how does the displacement operator act on quantum states? And the simplest quantum state we want to test out is the vacuum state. And well, not surprisingly, the displacement operator displacing the vacuum state by alpha is creating the coherent state alpha. This can be proven in one line. We take our displaced vacuum and we act on it with the annihilation operator. If we act with the annihilation operator on something, and we get the same thing back times an eigenvalue, we know it's a coherent state, because this was a definition of coherent states. So therefore, in order to show that this is a coherent state, we want to show that it's an eigenstate <coughs> of, the display, uh, of the annihilation operator. So this is what we want to do. Uh, well, the proof is very easy. By multiplying this expression with unity, which is d d dagger, we have this. And now we can use the result for the transformation of operators, namely that this is simply the annihilation operator plus alpha. And if the annihilation operator acts on the vacuum state, we get zero. If alpha acts on the vacuum state, we get alpha times zero. So therefore, what we obtain is that. So therefore, when the annihilation operator acts on this state, we get alpha times the state, and therefore the state is a coherent state with eigenvalue alpha. So therefore, in a graphical way, if we have a vacuum state, the displacement operator d alpha takes a vacuum state and creates a coherent state alpha. So if we want to have squeeze states with a finite value, well, we just discussed the electric field. When we 
related to the harmonic oscillator, we want squeeze states which are not centered at the origin, which have a finite value of x or p. We can now create them by first squeezing the vacuum and then displacing the state. What is the physical uh, realization of the displacement operator? Uh, I just one second. The physical res re representation of the displacement operator, we do that on Monday, is the following. If you pass an arbitrary state through a beam splitter, but it's a beam splitter which has very, very high transmission. And then from the, I'll just show that. If you have a state, this is a trans beam splitter which has a very high transmission, T is approximately one. Then the state passes through. But then from the other side of the beam splitter, you come with a very strong coherent state. You have a coherent state which has a characterized by a large complex number beta, and then uh, there is a reflection coefficient, r, which is very small. Uh, it sort of reflects the coherent state with an amplitude r beta. And if you mix together the transmitted state and r beta, I will show that you explicitly by doing a quantum treatment of the beam splitter, what you get is the initial state is pretty much transmitted without attenuation. But the reflected part of the strong coherent state, you, co you compensate for the small r by a large beta, does actually an exact displacement of r beta. So you think it's, a, I mean, it's actually great. The beam splitter is a wonderful device. You think you have a displacement operator formulated with, uh, you know, a's and a daggers. It looks like something extract, but you can go to the lab simply get one beam splitter, take a strong laser beam, and whatever you send through the beam splitter gets displaced, gets acted upon by the displacement operator. Yes? So if you showed the displacement operator, um, when you act on the vacuum state, will displace the vacuum state to a state alpha. Does it still hold if you acted on um, like a, another coherent state, or in this case, a squeeze state like that? Yes. I haven't shown it, but it's really, it, it, it displaces, when we use this representation with quasi-probabilities, it simply does a displacement in the plane. But now, to be honest, when I say does a displacement on the plane, it reminds me that we have three different ways of defining quasi-probabilities, the W, the P, and the Q representation. And I mean, I know we use it all the time that we displace things in the plane, but I'm wondering if the displacement operator does an exact displacement of all representations or only of the Q representation. That's something I don't know for sure. I mean, are you going to be able to displace all types of light, like thermal light or any sort of representation of, of light that you put in? Is the same displacement operator going to work? Or is its domain just like the, the vacuum and coherent states? See, the fact is, the coherent states, uh, I've shown you that it's a vacuum state. Uh, I know that's the next thing to show, the displacement operator if you have a displacement by alpha followed by a displacement by beta, it is equal to displacement by alpha plus beta. So the displacement operator forms a group, and if you do two, two, two displacements, they are equivalent to one displacement, which is the sum of the two complex numbers. So what I'm just saying, but if you do the first displacement, you can get an arbitrary coherent state, so therefore the displacement operator is uh, exactly displacing a coherent state by the argument of the displacement operator. 
And now if you take an arbitrary quantum state and expand it into coherent states, coherent states are not only complete, they're even over complete. All you have done is you've done a displacement. Now the over completeness, of course, means you have to think about it because you can represent states in more than one way by coherent states. But if you have your representation, you just displace it, and this is the result of the displacement operator. So since the Q representation is simply, uh, you take the statistical operator and look for the diagonal elements in, in alpha, and if you displace alpha, the Q representation has been moved around. So I'm sure that for the Q representation, for the Q quasi-probabilities, the displacement, whatever we have, the displacement operator shifts it around in this plane. For the W and P representation, I, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe there's an expert in the audience who knows more about it than I do. OK, uh, we have just five minutes left. Uh, I want to give you, I want to, sh uh, I want to discuss now the electric field of squeezed states. And for that, let me load a picture. Insert picture. Classroom files. Fluctuation. Yes. So, let us discuss now the electric field of squeeze states. So just as a reminder, we can discuss the electric field by using the quasi-probability representation. And the electric field is the projection of the quasi-probabilities on the vertical axis. And then the time evolution is that everything rotates with omega in this complex plane. Uh, so we discussed it already for coherent state. We have a circle which rotates. Therefore, the, project, the fuzziness of the electric field is always the same. And as time goes by, we have a sinusoidal varying electric field. Let me just make one comment. If you read the literature, look into the literature, some people actually say the electric field is the projection on the horizontal axis. So there are people who say the electric field is given by the x-coordinate of the harmonic oscillator, where I, whereas I'm telling you it's a p-coordinate. Well, if you think one person is wrong, I would suggest you just wait a quarter period of the harmonic oscillator, and then the other person is right. It's really just a phase convention. What do you assume to be t equals 0? It's really arbitrary. But here in this course, I will use the projection on the vertical axis. OK, if you project the number state, we get always zero electric field with a large uncertainty. So that's just a reminder. But now we have a squeezed state. It's a displaced, squeezed state. And if we project it onto the y-axis, we have first some large uncertainty. I think this plot assumes that we rotate with negative time. So I apologize for that, but uh, you can just invert time if you want. So after a quarter period, the ellipse is now horizontal. And that means the electric field is very sharp. So as time goes by, you see that the uncertainty of the electric field is large, small, large, small. It modulates. And it can become very extreme. Uh, it can become very extreme when you do extreme squeezing. So you have an extremely precise value of the electric field here, but you have a large uncertainty there. 
Now, sometimes you want to accurately measure uh, the zero crossing of the electric field. This may be something which interests you for an experiment. In that case, you actually want to squeeze, have an uh, ellipse which is horizontally squeezed. Now, whenever the electric field is zero, there is very little noise. But after quarter period, when the electric field reaches its maximum, you have a lot of noise. So it's sort of your choice which way you squeeze uh, whether you want the electric field to be, well, to be precise, have little fluctuations uh, when it goes through zero or when it goes through the maximum. So what we've done here is we have first created the squeezed vacuum and then we have acted on it with a displacement operator. Okay, I think that's a good moment to stop. Let me just uh, say what I wanted to take from this picture. Uh, the fact that the electric field is precise only at certain moments means that we can only take advantage of it when we do a phase sensitive detection. We only want to sort of measure uh, the electric field when it's sharp, or this is equivalent, we should regard, uh, we should regard uh, light is always composed of two quadrature components. You can say the cosine, the sine oscillation, the x and the p. And the squeezing is squeezed in one quadrature, but it is elongated in the other quadrature. So therefore, we want to be phase sensitive. We want to pick out either the cosine omega t or the sine omega t oscillation. This is sort of homodyne detection. We discuss it on Monday. Any question? OK.